Welcome. Today's project is going to be a calabash bowl. Now calabash bowls typically are round bottom bowls. They're really great bowls for a couple of things. As a wood turner, I love to do them so that I can check my skills and see how I'm improving or if I'm not improving. We're going to turn these thin walled. We're going to turn them green. Now the history, the round bottom is typically, there's a lot of history behind that. Having a table to set a bowl on and kneading a flat bottom bowl is relatively new to civilization. In the past, bowls were just set down into the, the dirt or the sand. So the word calabash is the Polynesian word for gourd. And if you look at these bowls, you can see they're the bottom of a gourd shape, as if I'd taken a gourd and cut it off. And these are still very practical. They, they wobble, but they don't tip over. It's very difficult to tip one of these over. So they're wonderful for popcorn bowls. You could even serve a salad out of them. And think of them as a good way to practice and then have a hostess gift. You can take a salad to a party and leave the bowl behind with some of your tool work on it. And so we're going to do these off the tool, which means no sanding on here. Most of these bowls have been done off of the tool. This one here is a Richard Raffin bowl and very nice tool work, no torn grain, very smooth shape. Richard even signed it for us as Richard Raffin, tool finish, no sanding. So he wanted us to know that this one definitely wasn't sanded. You can see with the green wood that they move and they warp and that gives us a really nice organic fill to the pieces. This one happens to be a Matt Monaco. Matt did this for us last summer when he was here. A couple of beads up on the rim and a piece of silver maple. Richard's was also a piece of silver maple. This one is uh, Mike Mahoney. This is American Sycamore or London Plain. Uh, Mike did put a little bit of oil on this piece, but it is off the tool. It has not been sanded. And just a wonderful piece there. Another piece of silver maple, a little bit of figure in it. This is one that I did. The beads are a little bit lower down around the wide spot on the bowl. And so it makes it, gives it a little tactile feel. It's a little bit more interesting. Again, you can see this bowl is no longer round as the wood has moved. This is another piece that I did. This one is American Sycamore also. I've got beads at the wide point and then I've got a bead up on the rim and that does help stabilize that a little bit. Again, all off the tool, no sanding. Wonderful bowls for, like I say, having popcorn because if you set them on the sofa and the sofa is not flat, these will register and stay put. Where, on the other hand, a flat bottom bowl may want to tip and then you got to get out the vacuum and clean up the popcorn. So, and when we talk about finish it towards the end of this, the best finish on these is buttered popcorn. All right, so let's get things packed up from here and we'll get ready to do some turning and have some fun today. I've got my blanks here for the calabash bowl and I've got a couple to choose from and let's look at the differences on them. These are both American Sycamore or London Plain. The first and most obvious thing is right here. I've got a little bark edge here. That's also a telltale for what the grain is going to do because I can see my growth rings going this way, which means my pith or the heart center of the tree was over here. And I've got that bark edge here. This blank, as it dries, will warp to one side. So I'm going to put the, look at the, the next blank and hopefully see it's a little bit better. That one will work if that's what I've got to deal with. And since I want that organic feel to it, that can work to my benefit. As I look at the growth rings on this piece, that's what I'm looking for is a nice centered blank 
off the pith. So almost a half log. Uh, this was a larger tree, but I'm, my pith was just right over here. And they've taken the blank just off the pith. And I've got that centered. And I, you can see my grain direction going right there this way. So this has been taken out of a nice plank orientation or face grain orientation. So I'm going to choose this blank. This one will be my preferred blank and I'm going to put this one to the side and I'll save it for later. So now that I've decided that this is the blank I want because of the grain orientation, we had also started as we picked this blank for the wood type. Again, American Sycamore or London Plain. It's a medium density hardwood. It's going to cut well. Being light in color, I, as I get thin, I may have the advantage of using a light on the outside to judge wall thickness as we get thin, or I, that's a possibility I could use that. One other, one other reason I like American Sycamore for this project is it has a little bit more movement than most of the woods that I deal with. When I'm roughing this out, I'll actually leave a little bit thicker wall than I would most other woods because I know I'm going to have some movement and I want to be able to return the bowl later. Turning this green and in one shot and hoping for movement, that's going to be work to my advantage here. This is fresh cut wood. I don't know how long the tree's been down, but the log is fresh cut. You can see this has got a darker color in it from the moisture. I can feel the moisture on it. I'm hoping that this blank is to the point where it's not throwing a steady stream of water out. That's more for the environment that I'm in today because I don't want to get it all over the, I don't want to throw water or sap all over the camera equipment. If but I could turn this very fresh cut from the day, the same day the tree was felled, if that's what you've got, or a longer period of time. The more this piece dries, the less movement I'm going to get out of the final product. And so, we'll definitely green piece of wood, and we're hoping for some movement here. Now, this being Green piece of wood, it's got a lot of weight in it from the moisture. And the larger diameter, 10 inches in diameter, five inches thick. I've got maybe a 20 pound piece of wood here. I want to have a larger set of jaws for safety and security. And it'll also add me stability. So I'm gonna go from my standard two and a half inch set of jaws on my Vic Mark Chuck to my five inch set of jaws on my Vic Mark Chuck. So with that, let's go ahead and clear this off and we'll get our jaws changed. As I change my Chuck jaws, we're gonna set this here and discuss this for a little bit. First thing I do is I face the number one jaw and slide at myself. And that just helps me keep things registered. I'm going to take my hex wrench on this particular chuck model. It's a four millimeter wrench. And I like to loosen all of my screws. And then I remove them. I'm going to take this set of jaws off, grab my larger jaws, and I'd like to zip tie my jaws together. I'm going to clip just the end. And by clipping just the end, that allows me to reuse the zip tie. So I'm going to save my zip ties as much as possible. Now, because I've got my number one slide facing me, I can look at my jaws, and this one's num get stamped number one, and the next jaw I grabbed happened to be number three. I know that's opposing. And then two, Vic Mark goes counterclockwise, and the number four 
has the safety pin in it. So I, I can identify where number one is and versus number four by where the safety pin is. If I put that safety pin at nine o'clock, that always works for me. Now as I put my screws, I'm gonna grab my screws. And I'm gonna start on the outer ring of screws. So I start on my outer ring. Now you wanna be very careful that you get those jaws in the right spots. Some manufacturers are very particular about that and if you move, put your jaws in different spots, your chuck does not run true. And that would be a, a very big problem. So follow all your backing jaws should have a number on them. Know where those numbers go. Get your jaws in the right slides. Now that I've got all my screws in and they're basically just say finger tight. Now I'm going to go back to my outer ring and snug things up. And I'm going to give this wrench just a little torque. I'm not putting a huge amount of torque on this, but just a little torque and snug that outer ring first. Now the reason I do the outer ring first is if I did the inner ring first, I may have just a slight misalignment of the jaw. And as I tighten that outer ring in, it could tighten that inner uh, jaw or that inner screw. And I have seen that in the past with chucks that have been tightened and that inner screw is so tight that you can't get it out. You have to drill it out and drill the head off of it so that you can get the chuck or the screw out of the jaw slides. And it's a lot more work. It's much easier to get these things right. Let's talk a little bit while we've got this thing, this sitting here about our chuck and its versatility. It's very easy to open these jaws up and this Vicmark has an incredible capacity when I open this all the way up. Now I'm about four inches in diameter closed and when I open this up that's almost six inches in diameter. One drawback I've got though when I hold on to a piece at that maximum diameter, I'm only biting at the at eight points on those jaws and I don't have as good a hold as I do when I'm closed down. So even though I've got an incredible range on this chuck, I'm very rarely open out that far. I like to keep the gap less than a quarter inch. that would be an acceptable gap to me and especially working with green wood because as I work I'm that those wood fibers can compress so I can come back in and I've got some room to tighten this up. If it was dry wood I might come all the way down to where it's closed. Well, I've still got a little bit of a gap. That's all, look, almost ideal because you look I've got full contact all the way around there. So four inches in diameter uh, times pi, a little over three. You can see I've got 12 plus inches that I'm biting on holding that versus the eight corners when I hold on to the larger diameter. So to me it's important because I believe that I get a stronger hold when I'm down closer in to the diameter. This is almost the minimum I can work with this particular jaw. It's 105 millimeter or four and an eighth inches and the maximum is that I would really like to be is four and three eighths or 110 millimeter. And you also don't want to mix if you've got more than one set of jaws the same size and I do because I, uh, I teach and so I may move things around. I keep them all separated and identified so that I know when I put a set down, they've got, that's an individual set. It doesn't, I don't mix up one jaw with another jaw because these are made one at a time and they could have just a slight difference from lot numbers. So let's set this to the side. 
And we're going to start our piece on a screw center chuck. I could use the screw center in my Vicmark chuck. That would work very good. It's going to be a little longer than I want, so I'm going to go, I'm going to, go to a shorter one. Also, the little screws, I have a, more of a tendency to lose those in the shavings than I do a big screw center faceplate. So this is the three-in-one screw center faceplate. I've shortened the screw a little bit, just took it to the grinder and ground it. And this is the smaller screw. It comes with two different size ones. Uh, but I am going to use the larger optional faceplate that attaches on that. And that's going to give me seven inches of hold against that bowl blank and actually a little bit larger hold than what I would get out of my five inch diameter Vicmark jaws. I've got my blank now. We've already discussed why I picked this blank. When I look at this blank, I've got an X marked on here from the bandsaw when this was laid out with a compass. But, and this is the side I want to have on the rim of my bowl so that I've got those growth rings coming around. But if I needed the other side, one way that I use for marking out and finding the center is the first thing I do is I take and put a guesstimate as to where that center is. Then I'll take a tape measure, measure the blank. I'm 10 and a half inches on the blank. Half of that will be five and a quarter. 10 and a half, five and a quarter. Get a little flat spot right there. We'll move around, 10 and a half, five and a quarter. I buried my red dot that I originally placed in there, so I'm pretty close. The human eye tends to want to go to center. And so if you kind of just look at the pieces and trust and mark it and then verify it that you've, you've got that point, you'll get better at that. So with that, let's turn this over. This is the side we want to be our rim of our bowl, so we're going to drill a hole here in order to mount it onto the screw center. I typically don't want to drill real deep. That may commit me to a depth that I may not want to be at um, if I drilled the full depth of the, the bit. And also I core out a lot of bowls and we'll talk about coring here in a bit. But as we core out bowls, I don't want to go deep. I could lose the smallest bowl in a set. So I've got a stop set onto just a standard drill bit. Happens to be 9 30 seconds of an inch uh, in diameter, which fits this screw. So I've got my drill bit, my stop set, and I can verify the depth. Just hold that up there. I've got about a 16th of an inch extra length on the drill bit as compared to the screw, I do not want to have a shallow hole and have that screw hit the bottom because if I bottom that screw out, it'll strip all the threads right out of here. So I'm gonna leave, I wanna be just a slightly deeper, 16th of an inch is fine. Gonna put my drill bit on center and just punch a hole, it's that simple. Now I could lock the spindle, pick this up and turn the blank and get it on there. I'm much too lazy for that. So I'm going to come in and start the lathe and it's at a very low speed. I'm under 200 RPMs here. You don't want to do this at high speed. I have a heavy blank of wood here and that's going to benefit me when I put this on because inertia will carry it on a little bit. A dry piece of wood is much more difficult to start this way, and please don't try doing squares. Give that a little push, and I just let the lathe take that out of my hands. I don't have my hands closed there, they're open up, and so the, the lathe just takes the piece out of my hand. Now I'm on a good size screw, uh, screw center face plate. That snug, that inertia took that up quite a bit, but I'm going to lock that and tighten that just a little bit more. 
and get that very secure against that faceplate. My tail stock is my very best friend. It's the cheapest insurance policy I've got. The lathe came with that. I'm going to set it up with a cup center. And I've I'm mounted between centers. I've got my tail stock in place. Let's get my tool rest. I'm going to set that for standard tool rest height. We're, I'm going to set this at about a 45 degree angle from the axis of the lathe and we're ready to start roughing this blank out. So we're going to grab our roughing gouge. Uh-uh. This is a spindle roughing gouge. We don't want to use this on face grain. Our grain on this piece is running this way. I've got end grain here, side grain here, end grain. As this hits the side, the side grain, that's the softer wood. The end grain comes around. I've got supported end grain, and then on the opposite side, I've got unsupported end grain. That's the hardest, densest wood on the piece. That tool would want to bite in. I don't have the strength in the handle here because this is a forged tool. It comes into a tang. Some of the modern ones are milled out of a brown bar. I still don't use those to rough out bowl blanks. I use my bowl gouge. So I'm going to go to a larger diameter bowl gouge. I'm going to use a half inch flute or a 5 8 bar if you prefer bowl gouge with a fingernail grind on it. Speed, 10 inches in diameter, times 900 is 9,000. If I go back to that formula, that's my maximum I should be at is 900 RPM. So I've got a place to watch. I want to be at least 600 RPMs to cut efficiently. As I start to round this out, I may need to be closer to that 600 uh, range. Now before we get started, let's talk just a little bit further. Because I'm doing a video here, I'm trying to project my voice, and if I had a face shield on, the audio would be muffled. I believe it's more important and more, it is much safer for you to hear what I'm saying than for me to protect this face, because we all know there's no hope there. But at home, in my own shop, I've got my face shield on. In fact, it's a powered respirator, so I'm getting clean air and protecting my face. I recommend highly you wear yours at all times at the lathe. Now, as I'm turning this, I've got options. If I turn this where I'm, I'm right-handed and my primary hold would be to have my handle on my right hand, on the handle, if I turn there and I start cutting in here, the tool's in this position, I'm in the line of fire. If anything should come off of this blank, there might be a hidden ring shake or obviously I don't have bark on this, but there might be a crack in here that I haven't seen and there's a chance that a piece could come off. I'm starting with a t roughly a 20 pound piece of wood here. I'm going to have that rotating if a part of that comes off, that part may weigh two to five pounds. It's not, wouldn't be unheard of, especially if I was working with a wood like a burl that is going to have a lot of hidden inclusions in it and problems that could occur. So I want to be out of the line of fire. When I'm talking about the line of fire, this plane here coming off 90 degrees from the axis of the lathe parallel to that bowl blank, this is the danger zone. I want to stay out of that danger zone as much as possible. So in order to do that, I'm going to turn left-handed. So I take my feet and mount them, step to the side. The handle comes into my left hand and I hold down low and I hold it into my hip. The right hand comes up and is on top of the, the tool on the rest, and that can also, I can use my left hand, my right hand to deflect shavings down onto the ground rather than throw them all over the shop. Or I can hold an underneath hold so that the shavings fly clear 
uh, onto the floor. Let's bring this up to speed. Again, I've got a brand new mounting on the, on the piece of wood. I've turned my lathe to zero. I'm going to slowly bring the speed up. I've got my hand on the tailstock and one hand on the potentiometer. There's 550, just past 600. I'm starting to feel a little vibration here. Oftentimes the first vibration I can get out of I'm at 900 RPMs right there. I've got just a little bit of vibration. It's well within what I'm comfortable with safety-wise on here. And I know once I cut some of this outer wood off of there that's running out of round, this will smooth up even more. So I'm comfortable with what I've got. I feel that I'm safe. I'm going to take my bowl gouge. Now I'm putting a red line down the bottom of the flute. At no time while I turn this bowl should I see that red line. A good saying to remember is red is dead. So I'm going to turn that tool over so that I can't, that red line's away from me. I want my bevel pointed in the direction I want to cut and I'm going to start edging this off and I'm going to keep my handle low. Just come in and enter. As soon as I've got a place for that bevel to ride, I'm into smooth wood and I'm not really on that nose bevel much. The bevel that I am primarily riding here is my wing bevel this one here. Since I'm not on the nose bevel, it'll leave me with ridges across the top. But I'm not going to try and ride two bevels at once. So there's two passes. I've already got a pretty good gap in between my bedway. That second cut was a full half inch width uh, cut. And you can see off the edge of my tool, all the shavings are behind there. That lead edge, I was riding the bevel right through that area. I'm gonna continue with those cuts a little bit wider than half an inch, no problem. I just gently feed that tool through. Now I'm rounding this up a little bit, and I want this to come out about two-thirds of the way up the blank, or I want the cut to come out about two-thirds of the way up the blank. I don't need to round this all the way to the rim because the rim is rolled over. It's going to come back a little bit. So I'm cut smoothed here at about a third of the way around. There's my lowest point and that's still clean. That's good there. I want to come in and start looking a little bit at this base. I'm going to true that off. Just step into that. Now I can also do that right-handed. I've still got most of my body out of the line of fire. My left hand shoulder is in the line of fire. And as I go right-handed, drop that rest a little bit so that I get a little bit better shear on that tool. The flute's closed over. My left hand sits on the rest. Close over the, the fingers go over the top of the tool, the handle's in my side on my right hip, and my left hand just simply closes the fingers. And take that in steps. And I can pull that back. If I've got that handle up there level, it's a full scrape. If I drop the handle, I get a shear scrape, and that's why I lowered the rest earlier was 
give me a little bit more of a shear as opposed to a flat. And a flat will wear my tool off much sooner, my edge off, and it gives me ribbons like this where a shear gives me curls. Much nicer. So at this point, I can also start to think about sizing my tenon in. We've already decided that for the chuck jaws that I'm going to use on my Vicmark five and a half inch chuck, I'm using the five inch jaws fully, almost fully closed, so I want to be four and an eighth to four and three eighths an inch in diameter. I can take my rule, two and a sixteenth, That gives me a rough idea of where I want to stop my tenon. So I can come in and I've got some wood here that's in my way. Again, I don't want to completely remove the wood out this far. I want to leave that and I want to shape this bowl coming around. Handle down, back to my left-handed cut, thumb on top of the tool or your whole hand. I can feel a difference in the cutting edge since I did that bottom and I showed you that scrape. I have lost some of the sharpness off of this tool. It's still cutting, but it is not where it was. I'm going to bring my tool rest in once again as I'm getting a gap. Switch back right-handed as I pick up the tool. And I come in and that, pick that cut up and I just arc, lift the handle and arc the cut in. I'm gonna go for about a quarter inch long tenon here. And then I'm gonna come out a quarter of an inch away from there and come up another quarter of an inch. And I'll explain what I'm doing there in just a minute. But while I'm right here, I'm going to reach over, pick up my uh, spindle gouge. My half inch is spindle gouge is right here. It has, again, a fingernail grind. And instead of 50 degrees, it's ground at 45. So it's a little bit sharper. And with the shallow flute, it fits the shape of the dovetail I'm trying to cut much closer. Confirm that I've got just that slight undercut in there. I can also reach over, double check my size, and I'm about four and an eighth, it looks like. This bottom's relatively flat. It's not, it's bowing out just a little bit, but it's not bowing out enough that it's gonna interfere and hit the bottom of the chuck. I, my jaws will register on this shoulder here and tighten down and that'll be a good, good hold. Now, I wanna, do just a little bit more refining on this curve here. I've got that step here. And if we're gonna do this thin wall, so I wanna get my outside shape relatively close to a finish shape. Okay, so I want to refine this a little bit more before I put it into, this, into the chuck. It's much easier to do it on this side than it is once I've locked it into the chuck. I'm, Keep my body out of the way, out of the line of fire, but I've switched over right-handed here. I've got my handle down very low. It's the same cut that I was using, and it's a shearing peel cut. With the handle down low, I've got the shear on that edge, and I'm cutting all side grain as I come around. and I'm getting a shearing peel cut. Now, if I'm not happy with this shape and I'm not completely happy with it, we're gonna do a little refining on the rim next, um, but then we'll discuss it. I've still got a bump down in here and I'm not thrilled with that, but we'll address that in a minute. So I'm gonna turn my rest a little bit here so that I can come back from the headstock end towards the tailstock 
and then close that rim over a little bit. Because I'm on the opposite side of where I was earlier, earlier I was turning left-handed to get out of the way, now I'm turning right-handed to get out of the way. True up the rim. Okay, I want to double check, make sure I've got the rim cut clean all the way around. I've still got, you can't see it, but I've got right here, I've got a little bit of bandsaw cut in the rim. So I'm going to take my marker, mark that. Looks like I've got it on the opposite side also. So I need to go just a little bit further, lower the rim just a touch, just to get it all trued up. Peel cut. Shearing peel cut against that face grain. If you open your flute here, you'll really wish you didn't. Keep that flute closed. I'm going back to the marks that I put onto the blank earlier and confirm that I've cut through that area clean. Now as I look at the shape, I'm going to do some adjustment. And I'm going to break some rules here when I do this. I'm going to set my tool rest up and I'm going to switch over on my tools. I'm going to switch to a sharp 3 8 bowl gouge. Again the same fingernail grind that I had on the half inch bowl gouge I've got on this 3 8 inch gouge or a half inch flute whichever way you prefer to measure. I like the European measurements and they measure the flute. The bar size does little, to, tells me little, but the flute's diameter, flute width tells me a lot, so I prefer the European measurements. Now I'm running a backwards cut, and it's backwards because I'm going against the grain. I'm going large diameter to small diameter on face grain, which I should be going small to large. The reason I'm going backwards is as I run this in with a traditional cut from small diameter to large diameter, that's a self-feeding cut. That's the, or almost a self-feeding cut. That's the way the tool wants to cut. But by switching over, going right-handed from the rim to the base, or the wide point in this case, to the base, I can watch the horizon and see the shape develop. And I'm cutting against the grain so it doesn't want to just take off. So it does require a sharp tool, and I've got a freshly sharpened tool. I'm going to push cut that, and I can see and imagine in my mind's eye, I can see down through this blank where I want that round bottom to end. And so I'm envisioning in my mind's eye where the finish piece is already. And I'm driving the tool to that point. Getting a bit of a reach right there. Starting to get some flex on the tool. We'll just adjust that tool rest in. And I'm getting a pretty good cut. So I'm back up and I'll take that in two cuts. Nice little skate there because I didn't have the bevel on. Didn't have bevel contact. Pick up might come up just above where I want the cut to blend. Tickle, find that edge. And now I no longer have that ridge or that bump that I had right here that's gone away. I've got a nice smooth curve coming around. I've set my rim up a little bit already. I could put a bead on there. I've left that on. I've left me an option. Now even though I'm cutting the wrong direction on this green sycamore, 
that has cut clean. That's good tool work. Um, but we'll refine that a little bit. We'll have to refine that a little bit when we put it into our, our chuck because it may not run dead true. And that's just the nature of how working with wood is. So as I go down my checklist to see if I'm ready to take this off of the screw center chuck, I look at this, I've got a good shape. I'm happy enough with the shape. I'm cut clean all the way around. I've got a good tenon on here. I've still got an original center mark, which I'll want later on here. So now I'm able to go in and set, take the blank off and set it to the side and put on my screw, my scroll chuck. So I'm gonna lock my spindle. Unscrew this from my screw center. Grab my spanner. Take off my screw center and I'll get my chuck and then we'll be ready to go. I've got my chuck. Again, I support the weight of the chuck with my hand and then I turn the hand wheel and the spindle to start the chuck. That last little bit, I give that just a little bit of a flick and that'll lock that on. Got my chuck key. I like to take and line my jaws up to where they're vertical, the gaps are vertical and horizontal. And then I'll take the end grain of my piece, which I've got right here, and I'll put the end grain in between the two, the jaws, the opening of the jaws, and that'll be either two and three or one and four with the chuck key on top with this particular brand. I'm gonna snug that up. You can see I've got a very tight little gap here, but I've got just a little gap. As I tighten this up, I've got two keys that I can tighten up, or two key ways I can tighten up, and I go around three times. So one, two, three. Each time putting equal amounts of pressure on, and I, that picks up the mechanical slop in the scroll gears and every chuck's gonna have some. But I, three times with the same pressure, I, I feel that I'm no longer torquing things in. Now I also believe that because I've got my end grain here between the, the jaws, the gap, and side grain on the other side, I'm biting equally in biased on that wood, and I believe I have less chance of knocking it out of running true and the two things that are doing that for me, my jaws are fairly closed and the way I'm mounting the wood. I don't expect to completely get away from not having to true this blank up, but I want it to be as accurate as I can. Set my chuck key to the side. Let's set up to do a shear scrape on this surface here. Now again, I'm gonna put my chuck key or my keyway to the 12 o'clock position, and then I've got a gap in my jaws at the nine o'clock position, and that will help me find my height for my tool rest. Now, for this particular cut, I'm gonna come well above the center line. I'm, the top of my rest is probably a half inch above. Typically the tool that is used here is a half inch flute or a 5 8 shaft flute or gouge with a long fingernail grind or more commonly known as an Irish grind. And they use that heavy tool because of the, you've got to reach so far over the rest. But by sliding the rest elevation up to where I'm a half an inch or so above center, I'm not restricted to using that heavy tool. I'm using a 3 8 gouge, freshly sharpened edge with a standard fingernail grind. Now before I start this up, because this is a new mounting, I'm gonna make sure everything spins clear, 
spins free by turning the hand wheel by hand. I've turned my potentiometer down to zero. So I've, again, I've got one hand on the, the lathe as I bring my machine up to speed, filling for vibration. There's my 900 RPMs. I'm running much smoother than where I started and we had that little bit of vibration and I, I turned that out of there. So I'm really comfortable now. One thing, I don't have my tail stock up here because I'm very confident in the security of the, the security of this hold. And the fact is, I'm only gonna be taking very light cuts off of this. But if you're concerned about it, by all means, bring your tail stock up as a cheap insurance policy. If, and another thing, you could back that off just a 16th of an inch. That'll help if you had a problem, that'll keep it from possibly getting at you, at least giving you a second or two to get out of the way because it's got to go through there. But that may be enough to hold that in between centers. The reality is, if I can't do the outside of this bowl with the light cuts that I'll be taking and showing you here, without the tailstock, I have no chance of keeping this piece in the chuck when I go to do the heavier cuts on the inside of the bowl. And I don't want this piece moving in the chuck because then I'll have to go back through and re everything up. So I've cut my tenon proper. There's no gap between the jaws of this, the, top, the shoulder on the jaws of this and the shoulder on the wood. It's nice and tight all the way back through there. There's no way I could fit a single $100 bill in there. If you can get a $100 bill in there, start st stuffing more in there and see how big a gap you got. Then take those $100 bills, put them in an envelope. I prefer you address it to Kirk to here, care of Craft Supplies USA. I'll figure out what to do with those $100 bills that fit in there for you, or put them in there as an emergency fund to help pay your deductible when you go to the emergency room. This tenon design is very critical. Don't take, ah, it's close enough as an excuse here. Make sure that's right. And that is not just this bowl, that's every single piece you put in a check. Be mindful of that. You want to have the very best possible so hold that you can get air on the side of being safe. So we'll leave the tail stock there for a minute, but I don't, I'm gonna back that off just a little bit. You'll see I don't move. That tells, that revolving center's not moving. I should not have, get that to spin at all. Now, as I go to do the cut, I've got the red line on my tool and I want to roll that completely away from me. I'm gonna have my handle down very low, below my pocket, actually, and I'm trying to get let's draw that line there. I'm trying to get my tool as parallel to my cutting circle as I can. So let's say that's that line right there, the red line that I drew on the wood is where I want to cut. I'm trying to get that cutting edge as close to parallel as I can to that, that area, and I'll just tickle that surface. Now, if that rest was down lower, I'd be hanging out over, reaching over the tool rest a lot further, and this tool would be chattering. So again, it's very important that I bring that tool rest up. There are several tool rests on the market that the way they're shaped, and even this one, you see when I come around close to the center post, I may start hitting the bottom where that flares out. So by lifting the rest, I also lift the handle and I shorten the reach and change the angle of approach on the tool rest. I get the same cut as I would with the long grind, Irish grind and the heavier tool, only I do it with a smaller tool. And typically, a smaller tool will cut cleaner than a larger tool. So with that flute completely closed, I'm coming across and getting that shear scrape. Now I've only came about an inch to an inch and a half, starting to leave some ridges in that. And that tells me I'm reaching. As soon as I feel that handle wanting to come up, I need to adjust this tool rest. 
So an inch out of there is about all I could get from the base up to there. But that surface is cut very clean. There's a couple of ridges in it that I'm not real thrilled with. So I'll back up, see if I can take the ridges out. My left thumb is holding the tool down to the rest, or down on the rest and pushing on the rest. My right hand is holding onto the tool and holding it in my body, and I shift my weight to move. I'm using large muscle groups for all of this. And I'm looking for a shaving like that. That is as fine or finer than the stuff I've got on top of my head. And the stuff I got on top of my head is getting finer all the time. So I can feel that I've also lost the edge on this tool. It's not as sharp as it used to be. So I'm going, I'm grabbing another one, same size, same grind. 3 8 flute, fingernail grind. probably even hear a difference between those two tools if the mic picked that up. I can hear a difference in it. That cuts much quieter, much nicer. Another tool rest move. And if you look right down here where I've been working, I'm starting to wear the paint off of this new tool rest. That's how low I'm holding that tool. I'm off of the lead edge of the rest and I'm on the back. So again, if I was lower and in standard tool rest height, I would be hanging that tool way over to get to that position. So lifting that tool rest above center definitely helps. Okay, I've brought that around, feel that curve. I can usually feel a discrepancy in my curve easier than I can see it. And so, and I'm working my whole hand on that surface, not just my fingertips, and I'm moving fairly quick to feel any undulations in there. So I want to double check that this surface is cut clean. Roll the tool over, flute closed. I'm on a surface that's 180 degrees away from where I started, so my tool is 180 degrees away from where I started initially. True up that surface there. We'll just kind of roll into that edge and see if we can leave a bead. We'll come back and detail that here in a second. So it's more of a roughed end bead. My cutting edge is 45 to 70 degrees from the, the cutting circle. The steeper I get it up to that 70 degree area, the finer the cut. If I lift the handle and I come up and that cutting edge is blunter or flatter than 45 degrees, I run the risk of tearing out the fibers. Kind of drawing that a little bit against the grain. Piece is cutting fine. So I can get away with that.
As I get into that bead, the handle comes up, the flute closes. Get my tool rest back to a standard tool rest height as I work this bead a little bit. Handles in my side, my hips are driving the cut as I shift my body weight as I come around there. It's a nice smooth curve on that bead. Catching a couple of little ridges right here. It's well worth spending a couple extra minutes to refine this shape to where you're really happy with it before you move on because you're not going to be able to come back later. And if you take a glance down at that, at the base, down by my chuck, you can see that curve going all the way through the blank and coming up the other side. I don't come out. I can follow as I'm going for an even wall thickness bowl. Once I get underneath this bead, I can measure the wall thickness all the way around to that added piece of wood and I've only got a two inch long cut that I need to project the curve through that is blind to me. And so that's gonna benefit me in finishing this piece successfully. Check and make sure the rim is cut clean. I'm happy enough with the curve and happy enough with the tool marks on here. I've got my outside done and where I'm happy with that I'm going to remove my tailstock. Now I'm going to take this all the way off the lathe. It's not going to do me any good here. I'll take my center out. That way if it tips over it doesn't break or dent my tip. Set that off to the side. Come in and set up my first tool I'm going to use is going to be my 3 8 bowl gouge, 3 8 flute, so I'm standard tool rest height for that. And I'm going to true up and define this rim just a little bit. My speed should be just fine. Nothing's really changed other than I've removed that tailstock. And I'll come in. That flute rolls over as I get deeper, so I'm not biting into that end grain as much. Just tickle the edge of that bead, anchor, bevel, don't want to catch here. We're going to go for the cut. Swing that handle around and start to drive that in. I can only go so far before I pick up a big wall of wood, so I'm going to stop just short of that wall of wood and switch tools. I'm going to my half inch flute or 5 8 shaft bull gouge, my larger gouge. Same, same fingernail grind on it. Set up my tool rest height at standard tool rest height. I'm going to start to open this up. Now all my cuts are going to plunge into the headstock. I don't want to push against that headstock or that chuck. I'm trying to force everything back that way. Any pressure that I apply is going to go back in. So I'm also going to point my bevel in that direction. Handle comes up to level. The tip enters the wood. Once it's in, I can drop it. Drop the handle and then open up the cut. And I'll just continue to work that out and repeat that cut as I go. I'm looking for a depth of about 
one third of this thickness. I'm leaving a little bit in the bottom as I widen this up. I'm not trying to get the bottom smooth at this point. I'm just trying to get wood out of the way. Got a little bounce going on that cut because I didn't come up to neutral as I started. I started with my handle down just a little bit. So I had picked up a little bounce. Once I get on the bevel, I'm into clean wood. And I can drop that handle. Takes a little bit of pressure with that front hand. Get that started and stop the bounce. I didn't worry about leveling up that, that entire top surface. That's just some extra work that I've got to, to deal with. And I can do easily put some weight down and get a cut started. I'm also much less likely to have a skate when I start with a broken rim or an uneven rim than I am with a nice level rim because there's less material for that wing to grab hold of. And you see, my, see me kick the handle out a little bit, trying to follow that outside shape here as I come around. Now I'm about 3 eighths of an inch thick all the way through this. More than that at the, at the wide point, I can feel that. I don't need to get my calipers out yet. But we're going to start and work this surface through here and get it down to thickness before we go in and remove any more of this mass. So I'm going to tuck my tool rest in quite a ways. We're going to switch tools to the 3 8 bowl gouge, 3 8 flute bowl gouge. And while this looks awkward, I'm perpendicular to the rest for where I'm cutting. And so it's very stable position to have the tool. Once I get in and my bevel is supported, I kick the handle out. Getting a little bit of growl. Not like in that direction there. Quieted the growl as I drop the handle and put a little bit more shear. On the tool. I think we can get away with one more cut. Lighter cut here. Drop that handle. This is one of the advantages to having a large lathe is I can drop that handle and get a lot of shear on the tip of that tool. You look at that tip of that tool, is at about a 45 degree angle as it comes around that surface. If I'd had a smaller lathe, even though this would swing on just about a 10 inch diameter lathe, it'd definitely swing on a 12. I've got to keep the handle higher and that requires me to open the flute a little bit more rather than drop it and get the shear. Okay, I can still feel I've got some material there. We're gonna confirm with our calipers so the first thing I do with my calipers is I bring them together and I check my ends and make sure that they're touching. And if they're not, I know what the difference is. This one's got about a 32nd of an inch gap on this end. So whatever I'm reading down here is going to read just slightly thicker than it actually is. 
So I need to be aware of that. The other thing, these get dropped and they get bent and that's why you check them every time you pick them up and use them. So if I check, and I want to check where I'm running perpendicular to the wall and don't drag these across. And so I've got a measurement here, just over an eighth. And there I've got a good half an inch. So I've got a lot of wood that I need to come out. So I'm going to come in and take a little bit more wood up in this undercut area, this under this rim. I don't need to take any more here, but I'm going to come in, get on my bevel here, tickle that surface, advance. Now I'm seeing two things, or I'm, I want to check two things here. One of those things is my wall thickness. That's feeling much better. And the other thing I'm looking at, and I don't know if the camera can pick up these ridges in here, these compression marks. I've got some circular marks. And they're all the way through what I've turned. And they're even spaced. They are the same length as my bevel of my tool when I hold that in the position where I'm cutting. Because I'm down, I'm effectively shorting the length of the bevel of that tool. But I'm still leaving compression marks going around there. That's going to be a tooling mark. That's going to show up if, it's, if I was sanding this piece, which we're not. But if I was sanding it, that tooling mark can be as hard to sand out as torn grain. So to fix that and correct that issue, I'm going to go to the grinder, or in my case, just grab the, the gouge I've already prepared for this. So I've got a, another 3 8 flute bowl gouge, half inch shaft, same grind, the fingernail grind, but if you look, I have a much shorter bevel compared to the tool that I just used. And with that shorter bevel, I'm going to have a smaller compression mark as I come around that corner. Let's double check wall thickness here. Still reading a good quarter of an inch, so I've got room to make this cut. Right at the end of there, it's, it picks up the thickness about this point in the curve. And from there to there where I'm going, and you can see how deep I'm going by where the moisture mark is right here. And it's that last half to three quarters of an inch of that curve that I've got the extra material in there I'm still trying to remove. Be extra careful when you're reaching in to pull those shavings out like that. That probably isn't the safest move um, on there. But I know I had very light shavings in there and I could control it. If I had heavy shavings, you can get your hand caught up in there. So I've still got a little bit of thickness in that piece. One more cut, famous last words.
So safer method, turn the lathe off, brush those shavings out of there. And I'm getting thin enough here that I can actually see the shadows left by my fingers on my left hand as I roll this around in there. So that's, and I'm getting an even shadow line and I talked about that. I want to be able to possibly use the light to determine my thickness as I go on this. Check the cut for cleanliness, it looks clean. Check it for smoothness. So I'm gonna reach in there and fill the surface of that bowl. Check it against my smoothometer, right there. Double check it, that's as smooth as the top of my forehead there where the hairs receded and the older I get, the cleaner I have to cut. So I gotta keep improving at this game. Bring my tool rest back around. We're going to come in and start hollowing some of this mass out of here now. I've got my center post set up with about the edge of my, my piece. I'm not moving that over inside. I'm, I want to actually leave a little bit of a place for any shavings down here to possibly flow underneath that way. And I'll be working very close to that post. You're much more stable closer to the post than you are out on the edge. I wouldn't want to have this the other way and have it barely reaching over the edge. That can generate some vibration for you. But I don't like to block everything there. I want to give those shavings some escape route. I'm going back to my half inch bowl gouge because I'm bulk removal again. And if you notice at this time, I've set my rest up just slightly below standard tool rest height. And what that'll do is it'll help me get a shear on the tip of this tool. If I was at standard tool rest height, as I get deeper, it goes more into a scrape and I wanna keep that shear. So I'm slightly below center here. and I can use the ridges or some of the ridges that I had left in the previous stage as a place to start my next cut. Now the one thing I got to be mindful of here is my depth as I come in and I take this out and I just kind of glance out and I can look and I can see inside and outside. I know I'm not going to run into problems depth wise and I've got to watch the curve coming around here for the depth as this gets a little bit deeper or wider. I got to watch my curve. Really need to pay attention here to my thickness down inside because if I go keep plunging straight back in, and I'm running a curve on this, but if I was plunging straight back in, you'll go thin right here and that's where most of these bowls get or fell. If they don't fell here, if you can get past this part, that's a tricky one getting that undercut rim and then you forget to turn the corner as you're coming in and hollowing that out and you end up going too thin here. So we'll double check with our caliper. It's gonna reach in there and measure better this way. So I know I'm a 64th of an inch thinner there and I've got a good inch of wood on that. So I'm in good shape there. 
The edge on this tool has dropped off. It's no longer as sharp as it could be. So I'm going to grab a, one that has just been at the grinder to continue on for a couple more passes here. You see how the body moves and swings around? Once that handle comes around, gets into my side, and shifting my body weight. Now I'm watching the edge of that gouge and the rim of the bowl also. I don't want that to come over and touch and hit. If that does, that, uh, your tendency is to push off of the bevel and that'll leave you a ridge in the work. And so I'm, right now I'm good. Brand new set of calipers are a little sticky. I'm down to about 7 sixteenths of an inch. And I want to get just a little thinner. I'm going to go ahead and put the tool rest back in this position. Shorten that reach that I'm hanging over and come work around this curve. Now that I've moved my tool rest in, I'm going to go to a smaller tool to get a cleaner cut and also leave less compression marks as I come around that corner. There's my short one. My hand is at the front of the handle and I'm gonna tuck that back of that handle up under my forearm if I need to strength as I start to reach over the rest. And then I'm going to come in, pick up that, drag backwards a little bit on the heel just to pull those shavings out of there. Pick up my cut. No edge. All right. That didn't pick, I was in there. It didn't pick up the cut. You saw how much wood I removed with this short beveled gouge before I lost that very sharpest edge. And I need that very sharpest edge here. I'm getting thin. And so I went back to the grinder rather than push that in and find that edge and cause myself problems with maybe compression rings or a catch. I went back to the grinder and we'll come in and pick up that cut again. Right there, it came in and it just took right off. Knew right what it needed to do. Okay, that's starting to get a bit of a reach over the tool rest on that tool. And so I'm getting a little chatter on there and I don't want that. That can leave me a spiral groove in the piece. Just over an eighth of an inch. One more cut. I can also see this start stop in here. Might feel as a ridge. Got sawdust on my fingers. Yeah, there's a ridge right there. I'm gonna come in and try and smooth that up. I can see as I get higher out of the, the lights, I can see the shadow from my fingers on the back side. My left hand is just gliding on that wood. It's not rubbing. It's just floating across there, but it is helping stabilize that cut. Same point. In, at the same point, I start to pick up that a little bit of vibration. And if I flex this rim, I can just, I can easily flex out with my thumb. If you can flex it, you should not be trying to cut out there. 
So I did that first and then stepped back so that I don't have to worry about coming back and cutting on that surface. So let's come back in, look at this mound of wood and see if we can get rid of some more of that. Back to my half inch flute or 5 8 shaft, fingernail grind, rest slightly below standard tool rest height, again so that I can get the shear angle and I've got to get some depth on this and get in here a little bit. Start op opening this up. Again, our force is primarily going towards the headstock. Now at this point, listen to the cut. And as I come around the corner and start coming across the axis of the lathe, I'm also cutting into end grain wood from cutting down the face grain. I'm turning the corner and going into end grain side grain and you hear the pitch of the cut change. It's much harsher as I come across the bottom because I'm cutting the wood the way it doesn't want to be cut. As much as I can cut down and avoid that sideways cut, the better off I am. Or the more I can cut down and in towards that chuck and put all those forces that way, the quieter the cut, the better the cut, and the less stress I put on everything. Tip my head out, look and see where my wall, outside wall is, judge it by my inside wall. Feels like it's on the right path. Get the caliper and check it. Yep, on the right path. And I've got that ridge in here and then I pick up a little thickness and I'm picking up just a little bit as I come across there. I can still get in there, but I'm starting to come around that corner and get into the end grain side grain wood and so as I think about which tool I want to pick up here if I I can probably continue around with this fingernail grind the wings getting just a little bit long and I know on the other hand if I go to a traditional ground gouge at this point it's going to have a lot less stress on the wood and so I've got this, this gouge is ground square across, 50 degree nose on it. I've got a 50 degree nose on my fingernail grind, but this has got the wings out in front of it. And so the wings in front of this tool will give me a different cut than the fingernail grind. My left thumb holds on to the tool, pushes down. My fingers right on the outside. My wrist or just in front of my wrist, my palm of my hand rests on the hand rest. My right hand's up near the ferrule and the handle is tucked underneath my arm. Now right there, as I came around, I touched that rim. I may have to change the grind on this tool to get where I need to get on the bottom. So check. Is 
going to need one more cut. So I'm picking up just a little thickness. in there. So I'm going to come up relatively high on the wall, tick that, kick the tool clear in. You hear that bouncing? There, I've got my cut. Not liking that, it's flexing. As thin as this piece is, I wouldn't want to come into this with a scraper. Much prefer to cut it if I can. And I wouldn't want to scrape this high up on the wall either. It's an uneven grain surface and the scraper works best on an even grain surface. It will work right in the bottom, but it won't work good up on the sides. It would start to tear out the grain. That feels much better. That looks much better. We're an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch. Lower my rest, tuck it in just slightly. I've got my tool rolled upside down and I'm using that front wing With that tool upside down, that front wing's shearing at about a 70 degree angle on there and coming around. And it's just a beautiful shear cut as that comes around. I am in no danger of a catch because my corners are well away from any cutting edge. And the only way I'd get a catch would be swing that clear over and grab a corner in there. Or if I came on the back wing, I'm more likely to have a catch. Now, while we're on this subject, a lot of people like to slightly pull the wings back on this tool. I like mine straight across. If you pull the wings back and you try to come in and get on that back wing and do that shear cut, it lays that back wing down a little bit too much and that'll cause a catch. But leaving that wing straight across is much friendlier actually then pulling the wings back I've found. Want my rest slightly below center again and we'll do some cuts out here with this tool to where you can see them and see it in action. You see how clean that cuts and I can roll that upside down the worst case right there, I got very close to it, I maxed out the cut. That edge isn't going to cut. If I bury the tip, that edge isn't going to cut. It breaks the wood off of there. But it doesn't become grabby. If you're off the bevel, this tool will skate back a little bit at you. It's got, and you hear that in the starts, it's got to be on a bevel. But I can also roll that flute up to the open position where I've got the wings ground straight across and shear on that back wing. With the tool in this position, I can see what I'm cutting. When I'm upside down in this position, it cuts a little cleaner, but I have to watch where I've gone. 
I can't see where it's, where it's uh, going or see what it's doing. Now right there I'm trying to enter and I don't have a place for the bevel so that wing makes contact and it skates back. And that's the drawback of the traditional grind is it's not got a point on the tool to make an entry cut. It has to have a cut ahead of it and a place for that bevel to set. There just it wants to kick you back until it finds a bevel. Now I'm getting a pretty good reach over this tool rest. Uh, they're actually more than I like, and it's grabbing the tool right at the center. Take a second and check with my calipers. Heavy quarter, maybe five sixteenths, so I can come down an eighth of an inch right there. So I've still got wood in here. Now, in order to get to the center and stay on the bevel, I'm hanging out five to six inches over the rest. And that's a lot of reach over the rest. The tool's going to start flexing. I'm pushing the limits of what handle I've got on here. So I need to change something. I can change my bevel angle and blunt it up five degrees. And so I go from this position to there. Well, and that takes about an inch off of this instantly. Just swinging from there to there. So if I go to the grinder, blunt this up to about a 60 degree nose, that's fine. The one thing most of us do is we tuck the, grind, the rest in like that. But if I'm still on my bevel, all I've done is made that unstable at that position. And I've got to where the ferrule hits. So that doesn't actually buy me anything if I'm on the bevel. If I'm working with a scraper, it would buy me some room. But on a gouge where I'm looking for a bevel riding cut, that's not the answer. One thing I do when I get into a larger bowl and I need a little bit more support is I kick the opposite side of the tool rest in. And now I've effectively shortened that reach. The drawback I have here is my left hand is right up against that rim. And if I've got an uneven rim surface like a natural edge, I've got to be very careful when I get back in here. I'm right on that rim with the tool. You can hear it rubbing. I'm avoiding, I don't want to push it off that rim. I'm trying to stay on the bevel. Need to slide in just the rest in just a little bit further. But I'm on the right path for that curve. That feels very nice. I've got a reach again, so I'll slide that in just a touch. The nub right at the end, right here. Slow down and try and catch that. Not only is it great sport to catch that, it lets you know that you didn't push too hard. If you don't want to break that off, you break it off, you'll go deep on the other side. And you'll have to make that cut a second time. Okay, so there's the inside of this piece. Now done. The outside's done. We've got, haven't had a lot of movement on the wood yet. 
We're moving fairly quick, but you can see how flexible this thing is. So let's move my gouge off to the side, clear some shavings here, move my banjo out carefully out of there. Now tucking that banjo in like that works because our tool rests have been notched on, on the corners. I honestly don't think the tool manufacturers or the lathe manufacturers know why they did that and notched those corners other than the guy before them did that. I believe it's for that cut as to why that is notched like that. It certainly gives me access and I think that's one position that is highly overlooked with the tool rest. Grab my chuck key, double check before I take this out that I am happy with it. And yeah, we flex pretty good. Still got some strength in the bottom. We'll take our chuck off. I'm going to go back to my screw center. And I'm going to pick up that other blank that I had. This is the second blank. We looked at this. This has the bark edge on it. It's a little bit off balanced. hundred and fifty, two hundred RPMs. Don't need to be fast. Don't want it to be fast. And just let the lathe take that out of our hand. Set that down. Secure, snug it up. I'm going to put my tailstock back on. My revolving center. We're going to use this piece of wood as a jam chuck. This is the identical size piece of wood that we started with the bowl. 10 inches by 5. Again, just like before, 900 RPMs, I've got a little bit of vibration, but it's doable. Come in, I'm going to use my left-handed cut. Just start moving some of this wood out of here. In addition to that, trying to true up the blank a little bit so that I get a smooth running piece there. They, that just took the vibration away. True up that saw cut. It's running much smoother now. One more cut just to clean up this edge. No point in dealing with a lot of out around. I think I'll soften this up a little bit. Now where I've got this rim closed over, a little bit. I'm going to try and cut a jam that fits that. So I'm right about there I can see it. I got two lines. I've got two lines right there. That tells me I didn't have that second one I don't think was a line. Okay, I'm just below that, so I wasn't seeing, I was hoping I was seeing a burnish mark. I'm not quite seeing a burnish mark. 
but it looks like my fit is going to be just on the lower side of this lower red line. So I'm going to start on the high side, so I'm slightly larger in diameter, and cut a very shallow taper. And I don't fit on that taper. I'm going to square everything up. Cut another shallow taper. Stop and square check it. There's only two fits here, too tight and too loose. And I'm too loose. I barely took any off of that top edge. So I'm just going to extend that out just a little bit further. That enclosed rim's coming around. I'm snugging up on that. I've still got a taper on here. I don't want to force this over this edge and split it. So I'm gentle there, that way. But I'm going to come in. Now I'm switching tools. I've had my bowl gouge in there, but now I'm getting into delicate, a little bit more refined cuts. I'm switching to my spindle gouge. I'm going to square up that shoulder because I'd like to get that rim up against that shoulder. Feels really close. Now, one question that everybody has is why don't you just come in with the skew and scrape that surface? Well, that's exactly why I don't. It's, that would be scraping the surface. I've got end grain, long grain, end grain, long grain, it's going to tear that surface out. I want that cut clean to get the best possible hold. I don't want it torn and a scraper would tear that. Just skim that surface. I don't need much off of there. That was so close to fitting before. That was just a little too much on that skim. I'm going to take some of this wood out of the way. As I'm sliding up the blank. I don't need that extra wood in there hitting the back of the bowl, possibly. Just a snug tight. Again, we'll try that skim cut. You can see I've got just a little ridge there between too small and too big. Soften that corner. Okay, still just a touch big. Better to take a few extra turns at this and sneak up on it. I don't want to have a loose fitting chuck here. Ok, 
Okay, before I completely set this on, now that's tight. One more very light skim pass. Hardly anything came off of that. Okay, before I go on and I set this on, I, I'm pretty sure I'm close now and I hope I haven't gone too far yet again, but I need to know one thing that's very important and I need to know how much wood I've got in the bottom, how much can I remove here. So I've got a hollow form caliper. These are the Mike Joukowsky hollow form calipers. I'm gonna reach in here Set that up on the center point, or on the center. And I measure this in metric, 20 mil. If you want, don't think in metric and only think in fractions, 11 sixteenths, 13 sixteenths, sorry, 13 sixteenths. So I've got 20 mil and I've got that caliper in my hand. Measure that wall. I'm six mil right there. What am I? four to five mil. So I've got to take a little bit out of this area here to match the rest of the wall thickness where I'm about four to five mil thick on there. And I'm 20 mil here. So, and that's to this part here that I never cut that was in my tail center. So when I put this on, I can take up to 16 mil or have this plug 16 mil long, and I know I'm not going to be too thin on the wood. If I have 21 mil here, I've got a problem. I've already gone through, because I know I can only afford 16. Still snug. I've turned the bowl out of a piece of sycamore, and this is a piece of sycamore. They're both green and they're both really sticky. So I don't need to have a super tight fit here to get it to hold on. Plus, the majority of the time that we're doing this, I'm gonna have my tailstock engaged. Skim a little dust off of there. I'm not, I don't need much off of here and you remember for every Whatever thickness I take off of this side, whether it's a thousandth of an inch or an inch, I'm going to double what I take off the total diameter because it takes the equal amount off of both sides. So while it looks like I'm not taking much, I'm taking double that. Okay, that's going to just sit down right over the top of that. And that's got a pretty good secure hold. And one next test, my tailstock should line up. If my tailstock doesn't line up, there's no way that I'm running true. I don't need a lot of pressure on the tailstock, so I back the hand wheel off, and then I'm just letting the weight of that handle hold that down. Now, there's, that'll secure the piece on here and not put too much pressure on it to change the shape. It'll also keep it 
from coming off the lathe if I don't have a good hold here or if I have a violent catch. New mounting on everything, so I bring my speed back down to zero. And I'm gonna bring it up a little bit. There's 800 RPMs. I'm running true out here, and that's one of the beauties of a jam chuck is the, it'll help on something thin and flexible like this, it'll help set that in and run true and support it. This piece now thinks it's a solid piece of wood or it's going to act like a solid piece of wood what it'll do on me because it's supported at the rim. I'm going to use my 3 8 flute, half inch shaft bowl gouge, fingernail grind, fresh edge, and I'm going to shear scrape and use a shearing peel cut to remove this wood and I'll use the shear scrape as a final. getting to where I'm having to lift the handle on the tool to get in where I want to, so it's time to move the rest. Grab my ruler. I'm 10 mil thick in the bottom. So about 3 eighths of an inch. It takes me to about 12, 13 mil. Drop the handle, close the flute, get the shear scrape going on. And bring that up a little higher because I know I have just a touch more wood in this area. watching my horizon and my cutting edge. My eyes are going back and forth between the two of them. Got a ridge right in that transition. Just come in and feather that out.
I've got a little bit of a ridge right here and right here or a low right there. So I don't want to cut on that low area. I'm going to come just above it, close the flute. That feels much better. Now I'll start to whittle down on this plug. Getting tight in there for this tool. A half inch spindle gouge reaches in there, gives me a little bit more room. Just step that off, shear scrape, blend it back together. If you're not, if you're concerned at all about this hold, it's a very good idea to go ahead and shut the lathe off as you pull that tailstock back. Give it one more check. I'm comfortable here with it that I'm not going to have that piece come off. Now one trick that I could do here, if I was concerned about this coming off, I'd take some stretch wrap and I can wrap these two pieces together. It will not substitute for a bad hold. In other words, if I've got a bad hold, the piece is going to come off anyway. But it will keep it from bouncing across the floor. Now I took time and great care to make sure I had a good snug fitting chuck here. I could have stopped on either of the earlier uh, tenons that I'd cut that were just slightly undersized and put a piece of paper towel in here. One piece of paper towel and that probably would have tightened that up to where it would have held. But I'm, I don't like that. I'd much rather recut it and have it set right to where I'm comfortable with it. Starting to get some movement. Yeah, I can see a little bit of a gap here. So I've got a shoulder cut into this piece right here. And I'm going to work down to that shoulder before I work in. I don't want to try and break off a piece. At that, I want to cut to the very end, but, so I'm going to stop just shy. That way, if I do break it, it'll break off. Outside of what the finished piece is, I'm going to drop my tool rest in order to get a better shear angle to shear scrape. That last little bit of the nub. You still feel just a little crown right in the center. Move my tool rest out of the way. I'm going to take this center out just in case things unexpectedly swing on me. I don't want to stick my elbow in into there. Fill that curve one more time. Oh man, that's tight. I need a drill bit and I can drill a hole right through the bottom and then stick my finger in there and get that off of there. Usually not the method that you want to take it off because we're not trying to create handcrafted funnels. 
I'm going to give that just a little bump with my hand. You can see it's starting to move. If you remember, that didn't seem to take a lot of pressure to put that on, but these two wet pieces of wood have a pretty good hold. Okay, now that I've got this off, I'd normally take this piece of wood, I'm not going to just waste it away, so I'm going to turn this to a roughed out bowl. I'd turn the outside, turn the inside, and then set it off to the side and wait for some sealer. But today, we're just going to move it out of the way. We've got our bowl, nice calabash rocks, doesn't tip over. It's got some nice flex in it. It's going to have some movement there. Now, if I want to accentuate that movement as this dries, it's going to have some movement. Between the end grain surfaces, that'll stay about the same length. But this side here, this long grain, those rings will try and straighten up so they'll collapse. So if I want to accentuate the movement on this, I can reach over, grab my stretch wrap, and wrap the long grain fibers and put a little tension on this. You could use large rubber bands, kitchen film, As you can see, that's moving to where it's got quite a bit of movement on it already. So we're going to let this dry overnight inside the stretch wrap, and then I'll look, we'll come back tomorrow and take a look at it. I'm expecting to see quite a bit of movement in this piece and have quite an oval piece. Oh wow, this thing really moved. So. This is set overnight and dried. First thing this morning to come in, I'm as surprised as you are. This thing has really taken off. Nice football shape. Let's cut the stretch wrap. In fact, my stretch wrap has lost a lot of its tension here. We'll cut the stretch wrap. Of course, that's going to hold its shape there. Really nice piece. Still, I can feel a little moisture in here. We'll be fine. It's not going to straighten back up by any means. It's going to stay this shape now. Now, the reason this didn't crack on me is it's turned thin and even wall. Even wall at this point is probably more important than thin because I could still put it into a false environment like a paper bag to slow down the drying process uh, rather than just leave it out on the, the bench top like I did uh, this one overnight. But even wall and thin, and that lets them move like this. We'll talk a lot more about drying bowl blanks as we proceed with this course. But for right now, this is a good place to be. Even wall, thin, got a nice shape on that. Good curve coming across it. I really, really like this piece. One other thing I could have possibly done here would be and take this into the microwave when my wife wasn't home and heat it up for 30 seconds to a minute and that would have even let this move a little bit more. I could have maybe got a little bit more stretch or compression out of this if I'd have heated it at first. But I'm real happy with where we're at on this piece. Now remember, the size of the blank isn't what's important. It's the tool control. So if you've got eight by threes, or eight by fours, or even some small blanks. I've got some little calabash bowls at home that I really like that are only about six inches in diameter. It doesn't have to be green wood unless you want it to move. It could be dry wood if that's what you've got. Just make sure it's nice and sound if you've got, you don't have any bark inclusions, any cracks. We don't want it to come apart. We want you to stay safe and have fun. Now, 
you can head out to your shop and turn your calabash full.